Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you. I'm Sister Charlene Muhammad. Welcome to Liberated Sisters, January 2nd, 2018. Liberated Sisters wishes you are experiencing and your loved ones God's peace, protection, blessings, and mercy in this new year. And thankful so much to be here presenting another podcast to you today. We're right here recorded live at Morris Media Studios. And so today we present our second installment of the Women in Islam series in honor of Mother Tynetta Muhammad, wife of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Our guests are Amina Muhammad, founder of Queen Amina Clothing, as well as Mariam K. Muhammad, founder of Heal Thy Life Center, Inc. You may post questions and weigh in through the chat room. You can go to MarsMediaLive.com and you can dialogue with us in the chat there. Right now, let's have our Liberated Sisters Justice Report. In today's report, we send a prayer and birthday blessing out to Miss Wanda Johnson, born on New Year's Eve, and her family, who just held a vigil for 22-year-old son, Oscar Grant III. Oscar was killed on New Year's Day 2009 by then-BART officer, that's Bay Area Rapid Transit District Officer Johannes Meserly. Oscar was lying on his stomach, everyone. He was face down. His hands were behind his back. Many debate whether or not he was handcuffed, but what came out is that he wasn't handcuffed by the metal instrument, but he certainly was cuffed with officers' knees in his back. He was shot powerless, begging for his life. Johannes Meserly was convicted of involuntary manslaughter as the first cop in California history convicted for killing someone under color of authority. Judge Robert Perry here in Los Angeles after the case was moved, the trial was moved from Alameda County in the Bay Area after Oakland, yes, and the Bay Area turned up in their fight for justice for Oscar Grant. The case got moved here. Judge Robert Perry sentenced Johannes Meserly after a jury convicted him of involuntary manslaughter to two years, and he only served half of that in L.A. County Jail. Here's a quote from Wanda Johnson right after the verdict. That just goes to show you that a dog's life is more valuable in this country than a black man's life. She reiterated at that moment that NFL player Michael Vick served four years. He was in prison four years for dog fighting. And so this is the Liberated Sisters Justice Report about Oscar Grant. We must never forget. There's a lot of news happening in the world today. There's so much taking place even as we speak. But I'll continue to lift up the name of Oscar Grant III. We are all Oscar Grant. And that mother and that family, Cephas Uncle Bobby X. Johnson, Sister Beatrice, Love Not Blood campaign, they're fighting. They're still fighting for justice for Oscar Grant because that was not justice. But that was a small, small, not so easy victory. You can read more about my coverage of Oscar Grant III at finalcall.com, finalcall.com, and that's our justice report. Now, we're going to move on to invite some phenomenal women here on Liberated Sisters. Again, I'm Sister Charlene Muhammad, and let me introduce you to Queen Amina Muhammad, right here, proprietor of Amina's Clothing, Queen Amina's Clothing in Lamert Park. Ay salam alaikum. Well, alaikum salam, Sister Shirley. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. And on the phone, we have Marianne K. Muhammad. She is based in Chicago. Sister Mariam is founder of Heal Thy Life, Inc. And 
be clear, both of these women do so much, and I'm excited. We're going to let you know about a lot of what they're doing to save and serve black women and girls. Sister Mariam, I salam alaikum. Salam, ma'am. How are you? I'm great, and thank you for asking. And how are you? I'm well, thank Allah. Wonderful, absolutely. Let me just uh, share with our listeners this show. Uh, series is inspired by and in tribute to Mother Tynetta Muhammad, wife of the Nation of Islam leader, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Mother Tynetta has had an effect and an impact on our lives and work in so many ways. And so this show comes in the spirit and in the purpose of Mother Tynetta's early 1980s, the Women in Islam educational series. We will highlight in her spirit, our guest efforts and work with black women and girls in the nation of Islam and the black community and all of this in the current social, political, economic, right, climate across the country. And so our first guest for this on Liberated Sisters, which we aired on KPFK 90.7, was Sister Sudan Muhammad. But we have so many women that we want to present to you because, you know, sisters, as I uh, continue and I want to share some excerpts before we get into what you both do, people really still today in 2018 don't necessarily know um, uh, much about us That's as true. women in the nation. That's true. You know, there are old school ideas and standards. And I don't even want to say old school. The word is erroneous. <laughs> Man, there's nothing wrong with old school, but the word is erroneous. Uh, perceptions about who we are, what we do, are we oppressed, you know, blah, 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 blah. So let me, um, (laughs) for lack of better words, (laughs) let me give an excerpt. I just want to really lay a groundwork for what we're doing here, and then we're going to come to both of you. So Mother Tynetta addressed the issue of flatlining with the nation and also the world. By asking the question, how do we treat our women? She asks, are they vessels? Are they part of a corrupt system that has ruled at least 6,000 years? Here is more of her writing, which you can also read at finalcall.com. Again, the Women in Islam Educational Series, Book 3. And her weekly column is in the Final Call newspaper, unveiling the number 19. Mother Tynetta says, when we go beyond 6,000 years, women were really queens. The women were oracles of their nations. The men would gather around the women to see into the future. For example, before Alexander the Great or any of those great warriors would go into battle, they would consult with the oracles, as in the case of the Oracle of Delphi. This reminds me of the Matrix and the Oracle, Mm -hmm. that sister. (laughs) Um, Mother Tynetta continues, even in society today, if we go back beyond 6,000 years, it was not patriarchal, it was matriarchal or matrilineal. In African or Egyptian society, the lineage was determined by the woman, the mother's side, to know who would be the one to come into power or who would rule. Therefore, women had to partake of the secrets of God. And so with that, I say, yes, Mother Tynetta, I understand. And indeed, because look, the work required the stamina, the mental ability, the endurance, the absorption of pain of those called to serve, those who answer the call to serve our people, can overtake a person if they are not aided by God. So as we get into our discussion, Sister Amina first and Sister Mary, um, share your thoughts on what I've shared from Mother Tynetta's excerpts on her series. Oh, uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Sister Sherlyn. You're welcome. Talk right into that mic there. <laughs> okay. All right. In the Women in Islam Educational S- Series, Mother says in Book 1 also that, as we were taught by the Elijah Muhammad as well, that a nation can rise no higher than its woman. Absolutely. And so when you look at the role of women today, black women especially in our community, and look at the status and the treatment 
look at the behavior of how we're acting today, then we know that this had to be intentional because we are we're the lowest. We're at the lowest point, probably, mm. even beyond when we were in slavery. Oh. Because we've lost, totally lost the knowledge of self, knowledge of God, we're, and the respect is... We don't have the respect that we should have for ourselves. So our duty and our role as women in the nation is to go out into the community and help our sisters. We have to. What else? What are we doing if we're not in the community helping the women? The women are homeless. The women are hungry. The women are in lack of need of knowledge and spiritual guidance. So Mother Tynetta's books, all three of this particular series, is so in-depth with teaching and training the women, black women in particular, in your role as a woman, as a Muslim, as a Christian, as a just a woman of God, a spiritual being. And that is our focus today. That if we continue to work in unity and in harmony and in peace throughout 2018, we can resurrect the sisters in our community. Thank you, Sister Mina. And as we come to Mariam to get her thoughts on the excerpt, I want to show a picture of the book. This is book one in Mother Tynetta's series, and again, series, pardon me, and again, unveiling the number 19, her weekly column in the Final Call newspaper. Sister Mariam, your thoughts? I definitely do agree with what Sister Amina said. And other things that are coming to my mind is, you know, of course, a nation can rise no higher than this woman. Of course, we see the condition of our young girls and our women out here in the community. And I think that what we do, unfortunately, is we allow titles to divide us. So mm-hmm. we'll have this group over here. I'm an MGT in the Nation of Islam. Or we'll have a group over here that'll say I'm a Baptist or I'm a Christian. Or We have to stop using titles to divide us. Yes. We have to know what are our similarities and what's going to bring us together so we can be a united front. Because these young people are looking at us and they're seeing that we're divided. Yes. And if we expect to be that example for them, we, in our generation, we have to become united in order to resurrect them, in order to reform these young girls out here who are waiting on us. When I go into the school system, these young girls are running to us. They want what we have. There are Christian women who have called me to come and let's do events together. They know what we have and they want it. And I always let them know it's theirs. Just because you are Christian does not mean you cannot benefit from the teachings in Islam. If we just remove the title, we're still under the same umbrella. Yeah. We all know that Allah is known by many names. He, we call him many names, but he is still only one. So we have to stop allowing these titles to divide us and stop thinking or becoming arrogant with what we have or that I'm better. We have to humble ourselves to go out here in these communities and get our young girls who don't know the value of themselves, yes. who are dealing with mental illnesses. And when we talk about mental disease in black communities, we shy away from it, mm-hmm. not realizing that all of us express characteristics of one type of mental illness or another. Mm-hmm. So if we stop running right. from certain topics, and if we stop arrogating certain things to ourselves and just humble ourselves, mm-hmm. then we can properly represent the words of Mother Tynetta because Mother Tynetta was a very humble woman. Mm-hmm. She was convicted in the faith, but she was humble. And that's how we have to come in order to win our sister. Sister Mariam, Sister Mina, thank you bo- both so much. I totally agree. You know, in what you're saying, Ms. Uh, Sister Mariam, I hear people... Not everyone even subscribes to God, right? They, some of us have lost so much faith. So how can you speak to a person that doesn't want to even talk about religion? How, you know, do you necessarily have to come in that vein or carrying the books, but it's the heart? I, I really appreciate the work that you do, Sister Mariam, and the work that you do, Sister Amina. It's really invaluable. It's priceless because for... Any young women not to have hope, you know, when hope is gone, I I find that really um, mind shattering. When the final call covers and and we continue to do so. But when I did recently some sex trafficking and human trafficking pieces to see a little sister with her pimp's name tattooed in her mouth. I don't even understand that. 
who reaches these girls. And some people do. And you're part of those who do. Sister Maria, I heard you say something. I was bear witness. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> oh, yes, yes ma'am. ma'am. So so let's dig into, and I, and you're right. Oh, my God, Mother Tynetta's humility. Um, <laughs> and if people didn't tell you who she was or someone whispered it to you or checked you because you might have been handling her wrong, mm-hmm. then you would never know. But she went among everyone. High and low. I mean, like the most esteemed dignitaries. Well, I should say people were in her presence that way. But talk about, let's go with Mariam, and then we're going to come to you, Sister Mina. Mm -hmm. Sister Mariam, talk about um, her impact on your work. Oh, a lot. Um, It's it's very impactive. There, um, I would say probably her and my grandmother are my examples. And because they, tell, I mean, tell us who your grandmother is. It's very critical. My grandmother was Sister Bernstein, who was the secretary of Master Prophet Muhammad. She was one of the first nine laborers, of course, being the oh. only female of those nine. Wow. Um, she played a very intricate role in the development of the Nation of Islam, as well as for us as women in the Nation of Islam. So. For my grandmother and for Mother Tynetta, they are my inspiration for everything that I do. Mm -hmm. I always think about how Mother Tynetta carried herself. Whenever I'm blessed to be amongst different dignitaries or even just being in the community amongst our people, I always Mm -hmm. think about how she carried herself, how loving she was, how non-judgmental she was. So I keep those thoughts in my mind. And then I, what also inspires me is the way she studied numbers, because I love numbers. I love the meaning of numbers. Every time I see numbers, I'm trying to figure out what does that mean. Every time I study, I always take numbers and break them down, and I'll go to the Bible in it, the Holy Quran in it. Mm-hmm. I'll research things online. But that inspiration really came from her. Mm-hmm. So for I would say that's probably like the number one aspect as far as the inspiration in my life when it comes to Mother Tynetha, the number one thing would be how she dealt with numbers. Mm. That I mean, it just, it resonates in me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Many people, you remind me of Sister Dorothy J. Muhammad, yes. who does tell me, uh, she performs tell me about my name, and she bases on that, those numbers and calculating and analyzing that. Sister Amina? Yeah. Oh, oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I have to say that I met Mother Tynetta in the early 80s, and mm-hmm. she was actually the first MGT instructress that we had. Mm-hmm. Um, the minister was had, was rebuilding the nation. Wow. It was 80, 81, 82, 83. So she was my first teacher of Islam. So she actually taught me how to pray. Um, how She taught us about cooking. She taught us to study uh, Quran, okay. and she taught us. She taught me a lot about fashion and designing Islamic clothing, and the reason why we cover. And so she, it was a really um, beautiful experience I had with Mother Tynetta and, and Sisters <laughs> St. Mary. I'm saying that she was my inspiration as well, mm-hmm. and uh, she was a, ph- a phenom. She is a phenomenal woman, and. Just well studied, well versed, and she would move on inspiration. And I think Ooh, that yes. was one of the things that I truly admired about her was that she had a thought or a vision, and she would just move out on it. She's she didn't gone. wait, and, that's and, right. And then it would always come into fruition. Yeah, yes, I've I've experienced <laughs> that. I've witnessed that. I've been blessed to be a fraction of a part of that. Yes, yes. Can I, may I tell you? Ex- I'll give you the example. Of yeah, we were at um, we were, we went in Hollywood to Shenyun. 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 The um, Korean, the uh, Chinese ballet. Chinese ballet, and there was, I believe, there was nineteen of us sisters. MGT. Look at that number nineteen. Number nineteen. <laughs> and mother said, "Well, we're gonna go." They had sold out of tickets, by the way. And she <laughs> said, "Well, don't worry about that. We're gonna get the tickets." And we were all looking at each other, thinking, "Really? <laughs> How are we gonna get these tickets?" Yeah. And believe it or not, uh, uh, um, well, we do believe it, but a man came up to us and said that his group was not able to come. Mm. And guess how many tickets he had? Nineteen. Nineteen tickets. <laughs> you all were probably like, 
alfalfa. <laughs> and mother was like, well, come on, let's go. Exactly. That exactly <laughs> was her spirit. Yeah. And there was well, so come many. On. <laughs> exactly. Yes, ma'am. No, there was so many situations like that and examples of that, that uh, she showed us how to have faith. Mm, That's what she mm. showed us. She sh- she showed us how to yes. believe in the unseen. Yes, and that right there was for me life altering, life changing, yeah. and that helped me to step out and do things in my life yeah. that I really didn't have the knowledge or experience, but I just believed I could do it. Yes, and I I, I think a lot of that came from I know it. A lot of that came from Mother Tanetta. You walk in so much confidence, and Sister Mina, you do so many Praise things. And I used to say when I was much more ignorant. How did she do this? Oh my God, that's a lot. But I get it. Having that experience with mother myself, um, even this podcast, this video podcast, just growing to this step. One day I, I thought about it. I said, this is here. You've been invited to do this, but you're waiting. What are you waiting for? Waiting for the money, waiting for the team, waiting for the infrastructure, waiting, waiting, waiting. And I thought about what Mother Tynetta told me one time. She wanted to go to the Universal Circus because she needed to communicate with, you know, the organizers of that. And it was after a Sunday mass meeting. (laughs) I had to do a lot of things I thought I had to do. And Mother needed to go. And so she said, get credentials. Mother needs to go. It was Sunday. Credentialing office is in Atlanta. I'm not understanding how to do this. I went down, tried. I called her mother. You know, I was really petrified to tell her because she wanted to go. Yeah. And I said, the office is closed, box office is closed, and we can't credential now. And she shared with me very deeply that anything the black woman wants, yes. anything, all we have to do is pray to Allah for it. That's right. Anything. That's right. Pray and it will be granted, but we have to believe that. That's right. Because we're co creators with the God. And so we have to believe that He will grant our wish, right? Our prayer, of course, in righteousness. In righteousness. <laughs> but I said, okay. She said, go back, sister, go back. But you have to believe. And so I prayed, went back, because I was crying. <laughs> I wiped my eyes. <laughs> Pardon me, wipe my eyes. And I went back and Jackie Stevens, our great sister who was a news director here at KJLH mm-hmm. and her daughter Stasia were coming up. And she said, you need tickets? And she gave me two, but we needed more. Mm-hmm. But I said, yes, yes. And that was wonderful. So Beautiful. then a gentleman came. I went back and I called mother and I said, mother, I have some tickets. She said, I need more. This is great. <laughs> and she said, see, sister, I told you mm-hmm. because she wasn't phased by it. Right. She knew, but I was excited. And that was really the first time that I consciously tried my faith. Yes. And I went back and when I went back, maybe this was the same man because <laughs> when I walked right up to the rope, he looked dead at me. Like he was looking for me. Uh, seemed to be Middle Eastern, kind of Native American. Mm. He and his wife and daughter walked up, and he just said, you need some tickets for the show? I said, yes, and he gave me six tickets. And so when I went back, Mother said, okay, we're on our way. <laughs> and and so I was still in, in, in enthused about that experiencing, you know, having my faith, you know, rewarded. But I watched that whole night, just the navigation, how people were interacting, interacting with her yes. and the work that she wanted to go to do. She did that. Yes. And then the outcome of that. And so, as you know, Amina, as you may know, Sister Marianne, one thing leads to another. And then Mother Tynetta's in the country somewhere. But then there's a link right to that one little circus here in Inglewood at the forum. Right. But Sister Marianne, let's hear from you. I mean, I was sitting here enjoying listening to you. <laughs> My bad. I didn't give you a heads up. <laughs> because we're talking about mother. She just has that, just, you know, she makes you, you like that faith. That word faith is real. But go ahead, Maria. <laughs> no, I mean, I definitely agree with you all. I have always been, um, I guess I was, because I was raised that way. Yeah, yeah. It's just, 
it, it, it's like second nature. Well, it's like first nature for me. I always take that leap. Uh-huh. I always, wow. I always walk out on faith. And sometimes my husband will tell me, like, you know, sometimes you walk out a little bit too much. <laughs> That's just how I am. I'm always yeah. like. I know Allah got me. I yeah. know he has me. I know he will provide a way as long as I am doing what the prerequisites are. Yes. We can't be reckless with it. I have to be obedient to right. his will. I have to be submissive to his will. So as long as I know that I'm taking this leap in accordance to what he desires for me, then I can take that leap. So we have to know and understand because sometimes we'll say, well, God didn't show up. Mm. Or we'll say, I I tried him, but I didn't get the answer I was looking for because you didn't start with him. Mm. We have to understand we have to start with God. You have to build your relationship with him. Then take that leap because then you know you're moving in the direction in which he desires. That's right. So, I mean, and like I said, that's just honestly, that has been how my life goes. I'm always walking out on faith and Allah always shows up. So wow. I'm very, very grateful, very grateful. And I love hearing people's testimonies because I'm like, yes, keep doing it. Yes, you yeah. will show up. Yeah. But it's when we begin to doubt mm-hmm. that is now when we build that wall that intervenes between our relationship with God. So, of course, absolutely, doubt is an enemy of God. It yeah. is a natural enemy of him. So we have to realize I can't do that. I cannot doubt him. I have to build my relationship with him. And when I call mm-hmm. on him, he will answer. And when he calls on me, I must answer. answer. Yes, it's ma'am. a two-way yeah. communication. Yeah. It's not just, I'm going to always pull on God. I'm going to always pull on a lot. He's going to always be there for me. Yeah, but what about what he's desiring of you? What about what he's asking you to do? Yeah, yeah, I felt that. So we, I we felt have that. to have that understanding. I felt that. Sister Mariam, you know, her... This faith that you exhibit and how you move out, thank you for doing that. Sister publishes a magazine and you have a seminar. Talk about your work, your seminar, your conference. Well, I, so go, much. go ahead. Um, we, um, I mean, like, of course, this year we have our third annual women's retreat coming up the first weekend in May, May 3rd weekend, where we're pretty much, the theme is freedom and forgiveness. So we're dealing with the forgiveness of self. We're dealing with how do I relinquish this pain? We have a lot of stuff lined up um, for that weekend, but I have a couple of other projects that I'm working on this year in dealing with our mental empowerment as women and dealing with our mental illnesses. And of course, I'm not going to come with the title mental illnesses because we're going to run, but however... That's um, something that I had on my heart, actually, when I woke up yesterday and I said, you know what, that's going to be my mission for this year. It's definitely going to be dealing with the mental health of our women and girls out here. So we go out. We um, Allah has blessed us to be in the high school, the um, juvenile detention centers, um, other city events with other cities. I was blessed yet last year to be a part of an event in Atlanta uh, sister Talk, which actually is a reverend. Um, she's the first lady of her church, but she's also a judge and a pastor. So she wanted a representative of the Nation of Islam there, and Sister Catherine LaShonda from Atlanta invited me, and I was really blessed. Oh, my God, I felt so blessed with that opportunity. But what I really saw was how much so many women out here want what we have. So every pastor that I came in contact with that weekend, we still keep in touch. We just text each other yesterday, of course, with the blessings of the new year and things like that, but it just really showed how much we have to get out here and how much our people are really waiting for us and how we cannot be afraid. We cannot be afraid to talk to our people, and we cannot be afraid to be that open book. I use every trial and tribulation that I've ever been through as an example I know Allah took me through it for a reason, and he took me through it, one, because he knew I was humble enough to turn around and help my sisters. He took me through it because he made me strong enough to get through it. So I'm an open book when I go in front of the people, whether I'm talking to the high school girls and we're talking about abortions, rape, it doesn't matter. Any experience that I've had, I share with them to let them know you're not alone. 
and you have somebody here that's willing to help you get through whatever it is that you're going through. So I thank a lot for blessing me to have that type of spirit and for blessing me to be able to be this little vessel that helps in this large mission because there's a lot of us that are out here doing this work. Sister uh, Maryam, would you say that um, love is key to us helping sisters and brothers with mental illness? You said, I didn't hear the first part. What, what is key? Love. Showing them oh, love, love. Showing that you care. Is that part Absolutely. of the answer to the uh, resolving and assisting sisters and brothers that have mental illness? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Because a lot of it, as you know, it, it comes from a lack of love. Yes. And a lot of us will say, just love one another. But so many of us don't know what love feels like. That's true. So I can't express what I've never felt. You have to teach me how to love. Yes. And when I go in front of these young girls, they say they feel the energy from me like a mother. Mothers that they don't have. So they they know the genuine love when they feel it. Because some of us go out there and and we try to give them this fake love. They identify it right away (laughs) and it causes them to move back. Wow. Talk on that a little bit, Marianne. Break down that fake love a little bit because they will be like, I'm out. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Because some of us do things to be seen. Mm, Or some of us do things for recognition Mm -hmm. or to just be Hmm. able to say, Oh, I did this, or I did that, or I'm in the schools, and I'm doing... No, 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 no. Mm. It's, it's not about being seen. It's not about recognition. Mm. Allah will give you what you need. Mm. That's why I never put money first. Mm. I'm not a hustler. Mm. I'm not the type of person... Money is not my forefront. It, it's not what drives me. Mm-hmm. What drives my passion is my pain. Mm-hmm. What drives wow. my passion is my obedience and my submission to Allah and responding to his call. Yes. So when I go out here, I'm working because I love it. I love to see those little girls cry. I love to see them smile because I understand that crying means that you're releasing pain that you are afraid to let go of. Yes, yeah, right. So I, I genuinely love them. I genuinely hug them and let them know I'm here for them. I had a young lady just right before this phone call from one of these high schools send me a text message because no matter what high school I go to, I give them my cell phone number. <laughs> and she sent me a text message. And she was like, I really need to talk to you because my life right now is hard and Mm. I'm going through depression. This baby has been raped and wants to commit suicide. Wow. So we dealing with real life issues out here and not to judge them. That's right. We don't do this to to judge. We do it to help, not to look down on nobody in their circumstances, but to help them get out of it. We got to be understanding and don't forget about the filth that we were in. And some of us want to say, I'm the clean glass when your glass is still cloudy. Still struggling. That's right. (laughs) Come on. That's right. We're still striving. Yes. Yes. Well, I tell and you, I let them babies know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sister Mary, I'm, I, I am in total agreement with you. I have such compassion for the sisters and brothers that are just living on the streets now. And in Los Angeles, um, there's so many downtown, just on the freeways, highways, just everywhere. And they're living in tents. Yeah. And so we have started um, uh, just, you know, MGT uh, in from L.A. We have started going out into the community and feeding the homeless. And I said, and I asked you about love because I noticed that the sisters are really hungry, first of all, and they appreciate getting some hot food, but they want to have a conversation, and good food, good Mm -hmm. Muslim food. But they want to have a conversation. They want to hug you. They want to embrace you. They want to know that somebody cares. Mm -hmm. And I have such compassion for the sisters. And we were doing it every couple of months. And I said, no, you know what? We need to do it once a month and and grow to the point where we can do it once a week. But... It's a real need, and, um, you know, we ride by and look at the people on the freeways, and we look at them and just drive by them, and, you know, we give them a dollar or five dollars, but that's just not enough. So more of us have to pick up our cross and go out into the community and help our sisters and brothers because, you know, what what does it mean if you are successful and you you have all of your needs met? But you're looking at our people on the street that are living in squalor. Just, And it's more. You know, there are more 
families, more yes. women and children, more men, women and children. Yes. And everyone isn't mental. You have someone that just lost a job and couldn't pay their rent and ended up on skid row. So it's, you know, there's a lot of dynamics, but that's enough to drive you crazy to end up on skid row. I mean, I could see someone really losing it just behind going through all of that. But as Sister Mariam is saying, that pain Mm. that they're feeling, if you can't associate that pain, then you need to really check yourself. Because that pain, to me, is what drives me to want to help and want to do more. I just want to share with you a little story. When I was a little girl Mm -hmm. growing up, now listen, we were on welfare. We were poor, but my father worked. My mother Mm -hmm. was a homemaker, but my father told us, like, during holidays and just some random Sundays, we're going to go to the project and feed the poor. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know, realize that we were poor. You Mm -hmm. know, I I didn't have a thought one way or the other, but this is what we did with my father. Right. We would go into the project, and he would give them money, he would give them food, and he would just go in there and talk to Mm -hmm. the people in the project. Mm -hmm. And so it's just really, I guess, a part of my DNA. Yeah. And it's just amazing to me how when you look back at the things that you were taught in life, we began to repeat them. You do. And so things. I had to give credit to my father. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for Queen Amina's father. father. You mentioned something, and Maria, um, you mentioned something earlier. This mental illness thread keeps coming up. And yeah. one of the things I'm thinking about is also our language, just um, about making it easy or difficult for people to reach out for help like that little sister that called you. Right, Mariam? Because um, Hydea Broadbent, remember, she became the little face of HIV AIDS as a girl when she contracted it. I read a post from her about a month ago uh, on Facebook, and she was she was upset because she said that, you know, when she's reading, whether it's on social media or other places, but in social media, you know, how people joke about HIV. She said, so now HIV and AIDS is a, is a joke now mm-hmm. because, you know— and, and and people do that with mental illness. Oh, she's bipolar. Yes. Or, you know, or they're schizo. But really, these are real, real deals that we're talking right. about. Yeah. And anything can drive a person right over that edge. That's right. They're just like right there. Yeah. Extreme stress, right. um, loss of job, loss of Loss of homes. Yeah. And it's affordable housing market with gentrification. Yes. You know, Sister Mariam, how did you find a way to break through uh, did you to the little sister? Well, first of all, how is she doing? Not to tell me her ins and outs, but just how is she doing? Because I want to know how she's doing. Well, she's still struggling. Yes, she ma'am. Definitely is still struggling. It's gonna be. It's gonna take a time frame because when we talk to these young girls, until we establish a home for them to go to, we yes. have to understand they they're going back into the same condition. That's exactly. Right. That's right. So we're wow. trying to build them up to be strong enough to get out of their situation or out of their environment. So sometimes I talk to them about other family members that they may have. So they just may need to temporarily relocate mm-hmm. to get out of their situation. And sometimes they just have nowhere to go. So we have to equip them with what we can so that mm-hmm. they can get past that moment in their life and understand that they can get out of it. They definitely can win. Mm. So we we have limited resources at this time because, again, we don't have a home to send them. That's to. true. Yeah. That is true. On the way. You know, one thing I thought about was I've spoken to many myself who uh, there's upset between mother and daughter. Yeah. Or the female guardian sometimes because the, the child is saying, you know, you know this is happening. You knew this is happening. Why well, didn't or don't you protect me? But can you talk about, Sister Mariam, the reality that of the denial and, and the way that someone may be coping with that and that's just what has been done down the family line? So how do you even get to the, to the mother and deal with that pain? So in some instances, we are blessed to talk to the mothers of these children, but mm-hmm. in a lot of situations, we don't get a mm-hmm. chance to talk to the mothers. The mothers don't want to talk to us. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have to, we're still in the process of breaking those barriers. Yes. And at the same time, it's like you have to prioritize. Mm-hmm. So in mm-hmm. the meantime, I can be working to break the barrier with the mom, 
but I understand that that young girl is my future. And She's focus. that future generation. I have to spend more time with her. She's more yeah. critical because yeah. she has to take us to the next level. Yeah. So she's more critical than the mother is. So sometimes we may tag team. We have situations within our own nation mm -hmm. where we may have to sit down with one of our junior MGTs. No, wow. And then we'll have another sister that'll sit down with her mother. And we might be in two separate rooms and then we'll come together. And that's what I was explaining to the Christian women as well mm -hmm. when I was at Sister Talk, letting them know trials and tribulations don't have religious titles attached to them. <laughs> yes, we all go through the same trials and tribulations. We got single mothers in the nation of Islam. We have rapes yes. that have existed in the nation of Islam. Yes. We have women who've been abused by their husbands in the nation of Islam. Yes. So don't think because I am a Muslim mm -hmm. that I am exempt from trials and tribulations. I go through them too. Yeah. So when we open up and we let them know that, it's like, man, so... I thought that you all, what you all had, first of all, was not for us. Mm. So when we go into these schools and we talk to the girls, it's like, oh, I can have what you all receive in Islam? <laughs> yes, you can. It's for you, too. It, it's yours. And when we give it to them, and even though for us it may be like, oh, my God, like, that's so basic. Mm -hmm. For them, it's the world. That's true. Mm. It, it, it's like, wow. I'm valuable? Are, are you serious? I'm actually that worthy? When you say a nation can rise no higher than this woman, you talking about me? Mm -hmm. So when, when you talk to them like that and then start showing them their value and their worth, like right now at one high school here, the next time I go, mm -hmm. the principal wanted me to bring the brothers with me because they was like, the, the guys at the school are upset with me <laughs> because these girls won't sleep with them. <laughs> so, this is crazy. <laughs> go ahead, Mariam. Right. I'm sorry. I'm laughing, but it's madness. But, go ahead. But this is what happens when you start teaching us our worth and our yes. value. Yes. We start closing our legs. That's, That's right. right. We we start understanding, whoa, I'm, my wound is an extension for your life. That's right. And that's how I talk to them and asking <laughs> them questions like, can he feed you? What can he do for you mm -hmm. right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're suffering in your own home that a father may be absent or mm -hmm. in some situations you may have a mother's boyfriend and a mother puts the girl out when the boyfriend is there mm -hmm. or the boyfriend is raping the young girl. You got so much that goes on yeah. yes. that when we're dealing with now equipping them with what they need, I got to equip your mind first. Yeah. Because they're going through so much no, that's and it's true. so heavy. That's and true. you know... When black people are talking about committing suicide, we're in a serious situation. That's right. Because that didn't even exist in our community. Yeah, That's yeah, right. yeah. It was like you heard suicide, you knew it was somebody white. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That time has changed yes, tremendously. Is. Exactly. Change. Exactly. Wow. So the the boys are mad. So <laughs> she wants the FOI in there. That's beautiful. But that's true. But that brings that balance, yeah, right? It does. Right. Yeah. Yes. How you is know, your experience? Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say in the Rites of Passage program that we have called GIFT, yeah. Girls Interested mm -hmm. in Finding Truth. Um, in our program, we were going in, <laughs> in and out of the schools, anywhere from elementary all the way up to some colleges, actually. But I started a weekly program um, a couple of years ago on Saturday where the girls would come to uh, a location, and we would teach them all, basically some of the seven units. We would teach them how to make jewelry. We would teach them how to sew. We would do arts and craft. We would have them do journaling so they can express what they're going through in their family life and, and how they feel about themselves, their mother, their father, you know, just to write down something. Then we would have them do creative things like um, well, the crocheting, the knitting, the jewelry, but also um, arts and craft, but also just really just talk one-on-one -on -one about how they feel about sisters mm -hmm. and girls. And, and what I found in that is um, back to our teaching is that energy is energy. So if we, if we redirect the sexual energy to creative energy, that the girls will begin to create. Mm -hmm. And I found those young girls to be some of the most talented, creative young women I have ever met. Mm -hmm. And one, and we did a really um, big show at. Um, with KJLH, mm -hmm. we partnered with them, and I had 500 girls. So we had about 10 different booths, mm -hmm. 
And so they could go to each booth and they could learn how to make something or or sew something or do something. And at the end of the day, they went home with 10 gifts. Wow. And it was just phenomenal, really. And the mothers came up to receive their daughters and they had all these items that they had made. And it it was actually Mother's Day. And so they had a gift for their mom. Some of them learned how to do African dance. Some of them was in the fashion show. And some of them just went around and and mastered all 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 of the um um their gifts and talents by expressing themselves with the jury and mm-hmm. the and the arts and craft. Wow. And it was phenomenal. I mean what they made they were so creative. It was items that I said, you know what, if you want to sell these items and make more of them, you could put them in my store. I mean check they were, that out. Yeah, the beautiful. ability to make something and have someone right there that can put yours on the market. Exactly. exactly. Great job, yes, Queen. Ma'am. That was beautiful. Yes ma'am. This is something. This is Liberated Sisters recorded live right here at Morris Media Studios. I'm Sister Charlene Muhammad, and this is Queen Amina Muhammad of Queen Amina Clothing. And on the line, we're speaking to Sister Mariam K. Muhammad of Heal Thy Life Center, Incorporated. We're talking about saving black women and girls, serving black women and girls. Isn't that a key word, sisters? Serving? It really is, sister. I mean, that is ultimately what we have to do. Mm. We have to um, get out, as Mother Tanetta would do, into the trenches and go out and help our people. Yeah. And in our holy robes, we have to go out and help our people. Because the clean glass next to the dirty glass in the instance of just going out in our Islamic garment so they can appreciate who we are Uh and what we have been taught and go out and serve them, that automatically makes, have them interested and learning, well, who are these women? Well, that's the key. And that's the key. Going as ourselves, which is accepting our own and being ourselves. That's right. Right? Yes. Uh, you know, that's right. <laughs> back to, I want to just jump back real quick to your conference, Sister Mariam. Sister Mina, you need to go this year. I did. I you need go. to, yeah. let me tell you, be ready when you get there. Honey, hush. It is phenomenal. Okay. I was so honored to have gone it's so serene. Mm. First of all, Mariam and her team, the Heal Thy Life team, just, how did you come up with that location? Because that in and of itself was what I thought was all I needed. I'm like, I'm good. I don't have to go to anything else. I can just be right here in this room, in this nature. How did? But I, you know, was wrong. There was much more that I needed and gained. But how did you all pick that location? I literally stumbled across it on the <laughs> Man. I just say a lot guided me to it because I I wasn't I've never been there before. The very first <laughs> retreat was the very first time I walked in that place. I had never been there before. Right. <laughs> that place is beautiful. <laughs> well, I, 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 my prayer is Amina, you go. And for those who haven't registered yet, register Mariam. Give the information if you haven't already on how people can register for this year's conference. They can go to our website at htlc19.com, which will route them to the regular website, heal-thylife.com. And all of the information is there and on all of our social media pages, which, again, is just htlc19. Um, And that's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, all of it. Um, And... We actually changed the location this year. So we're still, of course, in Chicago. Yeah. But we're about 15 minutes from O'Hare. So we made it much closer. Oh, closer. This particular resort is just as beautiful. It's more of a hotel style, Mm -hmm. but they have the elegance that we needed to take it up to another level. So Mm. we wanted to take it up to the next scale. And they have, like, a bowling alley. (coughs) uh, We have, like, so much planned. Even... For Sister Rachel's portion, when she does the yoga and the meditation, they actually have a yoga room. So everything is going up a notch. But I said, God's women deserve it. So we had to go ahead and take it up a notch. <coughs> what Pardon me, everyone. What Thank you, Queen. What month and what day is that? It's May 3rd weekend. May 3rd? Yes, ma'am. Okay, yes, ma'am. Beautiful. Beautiful. <coughs> You all have to forgive me. I'm at the end. I'm, I don't feel ill, but I have a dry cough. That's okay. I just wanted to share uh, also, Sister um, Shelley, another uh, issue that I see in our community is 
Uh, I am a doula, and I have worked as a doula for um, oh, over, yes, ma'am, over 30 years. Yes. And what I have noticed, um, when our girls are pregnant, um, you know, their mothers usually reject them, so they don't have that support. That's and right. They're That's ostr- right. Yes, and they're ostracized by their um, friends and, you know, the community pretty much. <laughs> and so these girls are going pretty much into the hospitals having the babies um, by themselves, which is another uh, hostile environment for this for this young girl. Um, the amount of cesareans, the amount of epidurums, the amount of invasive um, work that they're doing uh, with the yeah. pregnancies is just it's just so unnatural and unnecessary. And so I work as a doula and I do assist and work and I do it, you know, just free. You know, I do it for the sisters because I know they do not have anyone to help them. And I go in with them um, during the birth process and assist the um, the young girl or young woman um, through her birth. Because, um, yes, man, all praise is due to Allah. I just I love it because. Um, there's such a, a, a void in our community with just having a kind word, just trying to assist women and sisters on any level. So I noticed that some of the pregnant girls in the community, when they would walk by, they always look so stressed. And I just would ask, but what's wrong? What are you going through? What's happening? And this last birth that I did was really beautiful. Um, she ended up having an eight pound um baby boy and it was all natural but I was really appalled at how many times the doctors and nurses came in trying to convince her to have an epidurum at least 10 times and I was only there five hours and she had the baby but it was it was I felt like I was at war I I really 10 times pardon me I'm back they kept coming and kept coming and insisting that she have an epidurum. You know, there's a case where um, the immunization issue, there was a family, a sister came to me to write a story about it. They were being pressured to have the baby immunized and child care protective services were called. And there was really a standoff there. This is a one of our sisters in the community that I'm following up with on how did that turn out. They were in litigation over not wanting to do that, but they threatened to take her child, but yes. they didn't take it. But go ahead, Amina. No, you're right. No, that is what no, they're doing. That, they, that's true. They, they, in California. Oh, say, say that again. Sister Mar- yeah, because the law has passed. But, I mean, it's, right, yeah. yeah. It's really bad right now. And, you know, I would advise any sister that is pregnant not to go in the hospital by yourself. Go in with someone that's strong, that's going to be an advocate for you. Because at that point of birth, of birthing, you are vulnerable. vulnerable. You're weak. And you need someone there that's going to advocate for you. And so um, I I have just made up my mind that every sister that I see and that I communicate with, you know, I give them my card, my number, and I say, call me. If you want me to go with you, I do. And a lot of times, you know, they don't know you, so they don't necessarily want that yeah. help. But I'm telling you, they really need it. At least you can offer it. I offer it. You know, offer it. Go ahead, Marianne. I have a, a group of teen moms that I mentor at a high school. And just to know that when you get to the point of now we're in the delivery room and this is what they pressure them with, I'm dealing with a group of babies that... They haven't even gotten that far. Mm. I had one young lady who was five months pregnant. She she told me, she said, Mrs. Muhammad, I know I'm pregnant. I haven't had a cycle in five months, but the doctors are not telling me that I'm pregnant. They said they don't know what's wrong with me. She went to three different hospitals. Nobody performed an ultrasound or nothing. Mm. They just kept telling her she was not pregnant. They tried to get her to take pills that would have killed her baby. Then I have another young lady who was five months pregnant with twins, they forced her to have an abortion, telling her she had too many STDs, but didn't tell her what kind of STDs she had. So they killed her babies and forced her to deliver twin dead babies. Mm. I got another young lady in front of me Mm. that's like, Mrs. Muhammad, I don't know what's going on with my body. Nobody has taught me about pregnancy. I really don't know how my reproductive system works. Nobody's teaching these babies. That's true. And when they go before these doctors, the doctors are 
taking advantage of them. They yes. make so much money off of abortion. Yes. They use the fetus and put them inside a vaccine. We show these young girls this information. <coughs> We've proven it to them, what these scientists are doing. There's a, a woman who's come forward from an abortion clinic who says they get $100 a baby uh, to send to the CDC so that they can use the fetal tissue and vaccine. Wow. This, right. this information is out there. It is. So they're literally killing us wholesale, and it's listed. They're not putting white babies in these vaccines. It says black fetal tissue. Wow. So they're using black babies. Yes. <laughs> Sisters, I, I, it's so Go ahead. much. It makes you so angry. Yes, <laughs> but we you got to cough it back. Look, yes, ma'am. Well, you know, my sister, you have to. I keep stepping out. She keeps stepping this out. This is a great show. I'm missing my discussion. I'm so sorry. It's like, look, you need to get out of here. <laughs> but why don't you two wrap up with these your closing remarks? But this reminds me of Vaxed. And yes. Brother Tony yes. Muhammad yes. and yes. the movement and the tour that he's on regarding these vaccinations. But Sister Mariam, continue a minute or two with your closing remarks. And Sister Queen Amina, you with yours. You all have to forgive me. This is just like shut down Sister Charlene Muhammad time with this cough. But go ahead, Sister Mariam, continue. No, I mean, I would just say that it's, it's, very, it's critical to our survival that we get out here and we teach the women and girls, because, of course, we know a nation can rise no higher than its woman. We can say, get out there and teach the brothers. Yes, the brothers need to be taught, absolutely. But the woman is the first teacher of the child. That's right. And we're not going to stop the cycle if we don't teach the women. So it's critical for us to get out there and teach the women and girls, don't be fearful. Get some sisters that's already doing it. It doesn't matter. Just once you get with them, you'll get the spirit, you'll get the energy. Just, just go out here and teach. Just do it. Believe in yourself that Allah will give you what you need to be able to deliver to our women and girls out here. So I will close with saying that because it's critical that we get our butts out here and teach these babies. And that's true. That's true. And you know, sometimes, Sister Miriam, I think we take for granted what we know. We don't realize until That's you right. get out into the community that what we have been taught in our MGT class, and that is Muslim That's girls right. in training on Saturday, if we would go to class and study those lessons, we have been taught how to take care of our husbands, how to take care of our families, how to sew, cook. How You know, we have been given all the That's tools right. that we need in our class to, to know that we have to go out now and share with the community. And and I want to say in Mother Tynetta's book, um, the educational series, part three, the black woman chosen by God above the women of the world. And I know some of you may think, um, how could we be the chosen women of God in the condition that we're in? But I'm going to share with you her words. The black woman, like Mary, has been chosen by God above the women of the world to be an example of purity and righteousness to the extent that she will inspire the nations of the world toward true piety and righteous conduct. And that is who we are. And if we're not there, that's what we should be striving to become. And when we go out into the community and help our sisters and brothers, Allah will help you. You you have to be humble and submissive and also right. do the work. Do the work. The work. And as, as Sister Miriam has expressed, if I, as I have expressed, and Sister Charlene, there is a lot of work to do. Oh, yeah. Plenty. Plenty. Right. Sister Mariam, did you give your closing? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. As I was pulling my throat out. <laughs> well, I'll give mine now. Thank you both so much. This is installment two of Liberated Sisters, the Woman in Islam series. Thank you so much. I want to just ask everyone to remember finalcall.com. You can read our latest cover story on 2017. What has it been like for us this past year? And many, many, many other articles as well as store.finalcall.com. You can purchase the CDs, the DVDs, and other books and information from Minister Farrakhan there, as well as some of our scholars in the Nation of Islam. And Heal Thy Life, Inc., 
please go to Sister Mariam's links and also Sister Queen Amina is right here in the Mert Park, but it's queenamina.com. And one more thing I would like to say is, again, God's peace and blessings to us all in the new year. So thank you, sisters. Thank you so much, Sister Felicia, Sister the Poetess, right here at Morris Media Live. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and you can reach me at liberatedsisters at gmail.com. And look, we need sponsors for the show. You really don't, you know, closed mouths don't get fed. Isn't that what the old folks say? That's right. That's <laughs> you right. don't ask, you might That's not right. receive it. So look, Sister Charlene Muhammad is saying, I need some sponsors for Liberated Sisters so we can make sure this video podcast not only continues, but that it strengthens, right, and grows. So you can expand your business reach. Email me at Liberated Sisters at gmail.com we record here live but we broadcast on three networks that's right here mars media live.com radio justice rjla radio justice.org and kpfk long time 90.7 fm kpfk.org but our hub is here so get your three for one Liberated Sisters at gmail.com. That's our show for today. I'm Sister Charlene Muhammad saying if it's impacting our community or can uplift us as a people, let's talk about it. Peace. Mm-hmm.